Welcome to the Judgment Call Podcast, a podcast where I bring together some of the most curious minds on the planet, risk takers, travelers, adventurers, investors, entrepreneurs, or simply mind partners. To find all the episodes of this show, please go to iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or go to judgmentcallpodcast.com. For more resources, including how to become a guest, how to advertise, and to see all the lectures, podcasts, and books I would like to would like you to listen to or read, please also go to our website at judgmentcallpodcast.com. Like this show, please consider leaving a review on iTunes or like us and subscribe to us on YouTube. That will make it easier for other users like you to find us later on. This episode of the Judgment Call Podcast is sponsored by Mighty Travels Premium. Full disclosure, this is also my business. What we do at Mighty Travels Premium is to find the best travel deals for you as they happen. We do that in economy, premium economy, business and first class, and we screen 450,000 new airfare deals every day just for you and present the best based on your preferences. Thousands of subscribers have saved up to 95% on the airfare deals. In case you didn't know, Americans and Europeans can already travel to more than 80 different countries again, South America, in Africa, and in Eastern Europe. To try out Mighty Travels Premium for free, go to mightytravels.com slash MTP. If that's too much for you to type, just type in mtp for youcom mtp for youcom to start your 30-day free trial. I'm here today with Niels Flaging, and uh, Niels is the founder of Red42. He is a leadership philosopher. He's a management exorcist and a speaker, author, and advisor. And he also wrote a couple of books. Um, the latest one uh, is Organized for Complexity, How to Get Life Back into Work to Build the High Performance Organization, which is now available on Amazon. Welcome to the Judgment Call Podcast, Niels. How are you? Thanks for inviting me, Torsten. Uh, it's a pleasure to be on your podcast. By the way, you gave me a great opportunity to do some marketing, cheap marketing. You said, this is my latest book, which it isn't. Of course, this is my latest book. <laughs> No, but seriously, this is a new book. The other one is five years old. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. We want, to, we want to know all about it. And, and one thing that really struck me um, when um, was I was going through some of your work and, and I uh, looked at a couple of your YouTube videos. You do a lot of keynotes and um, I read into the book for a little bit. I admit I haven't read it entirely, but a lot of reviews said it's very easy to read. It's kind of in, in a style that that is away from the difficult management books that we have out there. And I really like the core message. Um, but one thing that really struck me, and I wanted to ask you that first, is you talk a lot about beta. Um, there's a beta codex. That's something you you um, promote. Um, I really don't know, to be honest, what, what it actually describes, and I want to learn more about that. But the idea to promote, um, to go from alpha to beta, is something that kind of goes counter a lot of, um, you know, I'd say, con general culture we want to be hedge funds want to be generating alpha and sociology you want to be the alpha in the group uh, how does beta fit into this yeah that's a very good point because that is really what i've been promoting for more than 15 years now overall uh, the beta codex it's the alternative to command and control it's the op uh, the alternative to pyramid shaped organizations it's the opposite to the opposite of management is social technology, and 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 as you just mentioned or outlined, it's 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 a pretty hard sell because we are so hooked on uh, command and control. Our, our in business, the metaphors, the the drama, the heroism, it's all about command and control, about uh, people at the top pushing people at the bottom. It's still it's still like we are stuck in the in the industrial age, a hundred years ago, in a pre-democratic age, which is. At the time of this recording, of course, a very um, important matter as, as well, how to make organizations more democratic so that our societies, like in the U.S., where we have this crisis, uh, democracy crisis currently going on, yeah. how, how can we make the world of work and organizations more democratic? And we have totally failed, utterly failed as, an, as a scene or as, an, as, a, 
as a total, you know, of business people, people in business, people working, we have failed to make our organizations democratic. And that's what beta or the beta codex is about. It's about consistent decentralization, about uh, giving power to the periphery. It's about federalization of organizations instead of creating top-down command and control steered pyramids. Yeah, so that's what I gathered from from what I know so far, and that's probably just 1% of 1%. What, what, what you basically say is that organizations, and you refer to an org chart um, as, as the tool of, say, oppression. So that there's, a, there's a hierarchy inside an organization, which I think we all take for granted. And we feel like there's all these, these levels of, of, of bureaucracy and titles, and often we hand out titles because it's cheaper to, to actually give people raises um, and give them real, um, real uh, attention within the, uh, within the company. And you say that a lot of this structure was built f and coming out of the industrial age where you had a couple of people, the management, who were the only people allowed to think. And then there's the workers who literally work the machinery, um, kind of work in a field or uh, with machinery, and they shouldn't they should think as little as possible. And th that, that seems like the, the working model from 100 years ago. But what I felt reading through this, and I know you, you, you developed this much further, isn't it already the past? Haven't corporations already changed in some way? Probably not all the way where, where we want them to be, but haven't they already changed um yeah. unfortunately when I, you know i live in silicon valley in san francisco uh, i can't count of anyone who has such a you know very uh, strong structure in place anymore there's still as bigger the company gets there's still hierarchies and there's different titles people hand out but it's all about teams i feel yeah we you know what you just said it it uh, it makes much sense in a way but look, look at this what if you, you mentioned Silicon Valley, where you feel at home. What if the Silicon Valley were the perfect example for how, sh how shallow the transformation so far has been, how pervasive command and control st still is, how we are beautifying to ourselves command and control? I mean, in the Silicon Valley, there are arguably um, beta organizations, as I call them, radically decentralized organizations. Google has been uh, one of my most beloved examples uh, for for many years. Now, not, not as much anymore because it has also fallen into command and control, into, into functional divisionalism and so on. Um, of course, there are exceptions to command and control in the business world. But uh, to, to claim that the Silicon Valley is a good example for how we have overcome command and control, that would be, I think we would, that would be an utterly inappropriate claim. You know, okay. if we look at companies that are the epitome of uh, of Silicon Valley, like HP, you know, how you look at it's it's a total command and control organization, and that's why it's lacking, utterly lacking success. It has been lacking success for many many decades. You know, since the 1980s or 90s at least. Uh, command and control is very pervasive, and of course, with the times, it is capable of changing its phase of its phase of beautifying and adapting to to times. Today, lots of of management or concepts are proclaimed as being about self-organization and liberalization. Uh, let me give an, uh, give an example. Design thinking, OKRs, holacracy. Those are concepts that claim to be about self-organization somehow or about modernism. They are exactly the opposite, sadly. They still blow the horn of command and control, of steering from the top. And I think it's easy to, it's easy in this year, 2021, to be somewhat uh, caught in the play that's happening in the, in, the, in, the, 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 in the game of facades, let's say, that is happening in organizations. I would argue that the real transformation has only happened in very few organizations, very few companies. And some companies, of course, have done beta for decades, like Southwest Airlines, uh, uh, Handelsbank in the Swedish bank, Toyota, um, I think Davita in, uh, in uh, Colorado is a great example as well. Borzark in the Netherlands. Here in Germany, we have DM Dogerimak, massive retail company. Uh, Aldi also from, from Germany and Trader Joe's, of course, associated in the US. Uh, those are some of the few weeks of WL Gore, well, not, to, not to forget now. And there are several examples, you know, quite a, a few dozen. But most of the other organizations are still firmly in command and control. And the org chart, as you said, uh, you said it's something we take for granted, right? 
um, uh, remember that Charlie Chaplin made a movie about the absurdity about the, let's say, fascist uh, character of of Orchards and the and the let's say the disconnection of the working pe person from from the purpose and the. Uh, the, the real functioning of the organization and the, and the functioning of the enterprise, you know, and this disconnect we have really solved it, uh, solved it because uh, in in the let's say 90, 90 or hundred years since uh, Charlie Chaplin's movie, I think 80, 90 years, we haven't really solved the problem, and uh, that should, and I think now this this lack of democratization of work it backfires in many of our societies and many of our countries, so it's a serious yeah, matter. I think it's very powerful what the concept you have in mind and the the thing i hated most when i still had a, a traditional company so to speak were performance reviews um, as a manager um, as a founder i sat into those and then i had some of those i always thought that's that's just bullshit um, yeah. none of this should exist and we also see that hr departments are a source for constant frustration, at least for founders, when they scale their companies. The way they set up right now is a source of, I would say, politics um, and less. There is an administrative function, which is often now uh, set into software, but there is a political function that kind of it takes the joy out of running a company. And uh, the last couple of years when I started companies, most of them were fully virtual, so they didn't have an office. Um, the uh, people were either set up as independent contractors, all of them were remote. And some of them were working in teams, some of them were working by themselves. What I felt, and I think this is where you're going, correct me if that's wrong, but we kind of see um, a group of people, teams, um, and in your example, it could be the DM local um, retail outlet. They, they're, say, maybe 10 people, or maybe it's 20 people that work as a local team. And from the outside, say, as, a, as someone who runs this organization, I only interact with a certain API. Um, I define certain inputs and outputs. I give you that much, and I expect that much. So often that is a PL um, story, but it doesn't have to be, say, for developers. I mean, when you think about GitHub, we the they self-organize into something much more useful where their own strengths come out um, much stronger. And there's no milestones, there's no project management in open source. I think this is closest to what you have in mind. I think that's scaled really far. And there's defined outputs and inputs to an extent to what you want from that software, all right, what users want from it. And then the individual can choose in which area he or she wants to really work at. Is that kind of what you have in mind that you, you, you kind of take the responsibility from a manager who says, okay, this is what we need to do. And you kind of go towards a team approach where people say, okay, this is kind of what I have. This is what I can give you. This is what I can sell to the, or the same organization or to outsiders and define those APIs and then just, you know, keep improving um, the product and the P&L. Ah, that's a, a tough one, because what I felt from what you just said, as much as I would like to agree with you, that we are on a good track, that organizations are on a good track, that uh, Silicon Valley is heaven, and uh, the future of work is coming because now everybody can work from home because of COVID. And so, no, 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 as much as I would like to believe that crap, uh, to be a little bit provocative here as well with you. I mean, this is supposed to be a session in which we, uh, you can provoke me as well, of course, in the same way. But uh, here's the thing. I would like to believe that that technology solves the problem. And you just said, Torsten, you, you use a metaphor, right? Uh, that companies are, said, are putting more weight on freelancers or more people become freelancers and so on and, and connected externally with the, with the organization. And you use the metaphor of the API. There's an API between those freelancers and the company. And, and that is, that is, that's lovely. The problem is that it, it's not like that because the problems we solve at work are not complicated problems. Um, the interface of an API, you can use it for complicated problems where you can have, you know, algorithm, algorithms, rules, how things function. And organizations, humans, human beings, stuff like innovation, etc., do not function that way. You cannot create APIs. Which I, I will give you an example that illustri illustrates the problem very nicely. I think one of the best companies in the world once was Google. You know, it was a brilliant company, and from the Silicon Valley as well, which we already uh, talked about. Google was a fantastic uh, organization. In fact, I'm not quite sure that it is still such a fantastic organization to be. No, I would disagree. 
it isn't it isn't great anymore but it i agree with the, exactly. the initial okay. i would argue it isn't great anymore but it no. certainly was until 2010 or so it certainly was a great company how here's the here's the thing one of the greatest insights i think that they had at google was that home office is not a good idea if you want to be innovative which is an idea that then melissa what's what's her name who is the, the the ceo of yahoo uh -huh. the number one I mean, number two, oh my gosh i forgot about the, yeah 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 uh, uh, this, uh, that, that was one of the first scandals that uh, came along when uh, she went see she left google and became ceo at um yahoo that she said home office is over you know we cannot have home office she brought that idea in from google actually and it was a scandal in the silicon valley as I, as far as i can remember in the media it was quite a scandal because of course the idea of google always was we must keep these nerdy software workers and these you know super smart dudes and girls and you know we must keep them together on a cool campus so, and and we must allow the dogs in their dogs they can bring the dogs and everything and we have these great restaurants so that they can chat that they can you know as introverted and silent as they may be we give them most the, 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 the we try to maximize the opportunity for encounter for collaboration for also the emotions that come with it so that we can enable you know, to become a hot house for innovation. And that, that is very serious. You cannot run an innovative company with people, with freelancers who sit in their home offices. It's just socially impossible. But I, I, I think we're talking about a couple of things. Um, one is how innovation works. And I, I agree with you, serendipity, cross-pollination. Those are just very important things. I mean, just random conversations, and then you, 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 you make experiences, you find, treasures of knowledge somewhere else and you, you transport it somewhere in a different sector and it, it certainly becomes innovative so absolutely true and for this it's good to be in the same office but here's the thing once people are remote it's much more scalable so obviously the hard question to solve is how can we be in the same mindset but not in the same office and nobody has solved that yet i, I give you this i do think this is going to happen though Someone and there's, there's just little bits of, of of innovation that already lead that way. Um, I talked to to um, Daniel uh, Daniel Rose yesterday. He has a fully remote accelerator, so he never sees the teams. He never does any per person due diligence. He basically only relies on data, on psychometrics as well, and gives people up to a million dollars um, without ever seeing them. Right? I mean, and they're in Africa. They, they're in Nigeria. And, and so he takes that, huge risk in this. That business will probably achieve. Exactly the purpose it was created for, which is to sell it to uh, you know uh, angel investors or whatever as soon as possible, and that's 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 okay. You know, he is I'm an not, angel investor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he I'm, invests his own I'm, money. I'm criticizing that. bullshit business and uh, the bullshit hype that is going on in the U.S., especially, and it is Silicon hype dramatically. And okay. uh, I'm not criticizing that. It's legit. As long as there are stupid people buying those stupid those fake companies. Like the one you just described, oh, it's totally digital, totally scalable. But let me let me cut, try to cut through the bullshit for a moment. The idea of scaling businesses is like the, it's like just tech hype lang um, language, you know. A company doesn't scale because society, so, uh, social, so a company or an organization is a social, a living thing. It cannot be just scaled. You can scale many things, you know, but not social stuff just like that. A company doesn't scale because it's not a machine, you know, it's not a it's not a complicated and dead thing. It's a living thing. So when you grow, when a company grows, you don't really you do not grow a company. A company grows and then you have effects. For example, if we grow our bodies, uh, if we take the stimulants and so on and do the fitness, there will be some decay in some places, you know, and it may not it may hurt our bodies. And the same happens to organizations. You cannot just grow or scale businesses. That assumption is it's it's part of the current hype that was that is very much a U.S. thing. And you, you know, I'm I'm talking from Germany. You are talking from Mexico right now, um, and we're talking about a, a, a phenomenon that is pervasive everywhere in the world, of course, but especially rooted in the U.S. This hype, this illusion that comes that comes along every ten years or so, and that which lead, which leads to a huge bust. We overhype certain things. And the scaling, uh, let's say, the scaling but, narrative. But yes, I think you is, are. Is, 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 you're, you're taking two things at once. I, I I agree with you. The hype, the hype. I'm 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 big 
critic of the current hype, especially in IPOs. And most of the companies that go IPO are bullshit. I fully agree. And that the hype really only propels them. They sell to the next, the next idiot buyer. Um, there is very little value in most of them. But here's the, the, I think a lot of people are missing, and I think there's a lot to optimize there. Is and we, we, when we go back to the dot com boom, um, I'd say ninety percent, probably more than ninety percent of these companies were crap, and they should have never gone IPO, and they shouldn't have gotten any money. But there were a small percentage, maybe one percent, maybe five percent, who really, who truly created a lasting innovation based on lots of layers of existing um, innovation, yeah. and those eventually became really big. I mean, when you see the amount of traffic that goes through, and you can say, oh, traffic is just traffic, but traffic is usually uh, connected to eyeballs. The amount of traffic that goes through infrastructure layers, say at Google or even Yahoo, this is this is insane. I mean, this is like eighty percent of the worldwide internet traffic goes through one single organization, and those obviously have found a way to monetize this over time. You, so you most of the companies we have currently are equally crap, and they cannot scale. But some figure out on a software layer, and maybe not so much on a social layer. They figure out how to grow. And, you know, become the fastest growing company in the history of the world, um, like Google did. Um, yeah, but but you're not just defending the 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 rip off economy. Let's say the the um, the value skimming economy that is the U.S. economy right now, and that has and it is a pattern that has been popularized internationally. There is a great book by a wonderful. Uh, economist and author Mariana Mazzucato, who distinguishes this kind of economy that you are describing, which is like value skimming, from the value creation economy. And we are not separating this well, especially in the US, you know, where every bank theft, every loan hype business, all the, the you know, the Wall Street over um, acceleration that we create, all the kind, the hype we create around the new Enron Tesla all the time and other companies like that. I mean, I mean we're not talking organizational structures here right now, or organizational models. We're talking a little bit. Yeah. The economics of the politics of economy. I, I picked up a book from Mariana Mazzucato, um, The Entrepreneurial State. Um, I'm not the one that you that you uh, just uh, referenced. I kind of like that. I like what she was talking about. I think I disagree with her in a lot of places, but the, her, her central thesis in that book was, and I think this is this is similar to your point, is that a lot of innovations come out of basic research. They form a certain layer. And then there's a company that sits on top of that, monetizes it. And very often it's taxpayer research that created the innovation. I think that is her exactly. core point of the entrepreneurial state. Which is also you know, uh, the, the history of the Silicon Valley is Navy investment, military investment. Indeed, and, indeed. And, and I she, have misses, to... she misses a lot of points because... Um, I think she misses we... very little. I think, I think the point miss that's, that's gone missing is when we show the photos, black and white photos of garages in the Silicon Valley, where, where supposedly the big innovation started. That's a lie. It's fraud. And that is no, what it, I think, really I think that's, that's what people sell. Like, yeah. to discuss, you know. We are claiming that, oh, private investment. You just, you just uh, use that narrative again, saying that, oh, Google, Yahoo, they created so much innovation. So the, mo the big monstrous companies of now are the ones that survived the last the dot com crash and then the 2008 2009 crash and and that's what makes the whole fraudulent rip off economy and the boom and bust cycles that the US economy and other economies go through um, uh, that's that's that kind of justifies it all and 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 and, and that's where um, economists like uh, Mariana Mazzucato step in clarifying well we put taxpayers money into certain industries like the silicon valley uh, you know uh, and the whole Silicon Valley is really a navy and a military animal. And to deny that and to say, oh, and then those companies don't have to pay taxes because they are so innovative. That it, it, we, are really, we are really driving. I mean, that's what, what makes society more divisive. In I, think, I think in you, you're minority. describing a popular view right now. I'm no, no, no. Go along with you're that. describing the minority view. Otherwise, we no, have well, it depends, depends where you look, right? In the US, I think in a, there's a certain mainstream view that have really adopted that, um, the failings of, of capitalism, so to speak. No, 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 no. But, no I'm not talking well, about what I was trying to get at just, uh, just on this point. Um, capitalism I think is not a problem. I, I research, I patents, um, that's a really interesting topic. Um, we, we should talk about um, what. what what Mariana misses is that these innovations, many of them are stacked 
in layers. Um, usually you can, because we, we, we use um, the um, uh, existing layers of technology to create the next one. Everything is dependent on everything. So basically you can trace it back to the Old Testament. Anything we ever invented is being used um, to create a modern company. And a lot of these things are not protected by pat patents. And I agree with you, um, Silicon Valley's strength is not innovation per se. Um, they often steal stuff and then uh, raise a lot of money. It's mostly figuring out how to use those innovations and put them in the hand of a consumer and get them adopted. That's very different value proposition, I think, than sometimes companies make out there for themselves. But I think this is their core value. Not sure what I can, what I can say. Uh, you know, uh, the... the, the mm, Okay, um, but I'm not a critic of capitalism, by the way, not at all. I think capitalism is the perfect social technology for the problems that we are facing uh, economy wise. The problem is that once you create something like the uh, military industrial complex that has really been created, especially in the US, which is more a war economy than an innovation economy, really. And I'm, I'm saying this as a political being, not, I'm, I'm saying this as someone who has lived in the United States for five years in, in New York. So uh, and let, this, is not, this is not meant cynically or ironically or, or you know, in any way depreciating what, what, uh, what any country might be or what, but, but uh, this um, over accentuation of winner takes it all, this is really a dangerous thing and it is based on, on so many myths. Um, you know, recently, I, I, and I mean, uh, the people who are being ripped off are not just the people who really do the innovation, you know. Uh, by the way, uh, somebody else I recently read about, you know, uh, an innovative person, Hedy Lamar, the also actress who was a great uh, inventor, the, the Navy actually ripped her off of the, her patent on, um, you know, which has become a core element of Bluetooth, you know, the communication patterns that she invented. So this ripping off has been going on forever, of course, historically. And, and we have gotten used to it, but, but, but the, the main problem, I, I believe, is that we are putting too much, and this leads us back maybe to the topic of organizations. We have over-accentuated uh, over heroism. You know, the CEO, Elon Musk. Uh, what's the Apple dude's name? You know, I try to forget it for, from time to time. Who, uh, Steve Jobs or? Steve Jobs, exactly. We are over accentuating at, as if Steve Jobs invented the iPhone. That's, that's what business, I, I read Fast Company. Or I, I had it, I read it for years actually, every, every but I couldn't stand it anymore. This, this bullshit that heroes create everything. Uh, it's, it's just nonsense. That's not what innovation is. Innovation very much, and we, 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 we are circling back to the, the topic maybe. Organizations are about social density. Innovation is about social density. H human and societal uh, advancement and democracy is about social density. And that is why division is so harmful to democracy, organizations, innovation, and social, uh, society's advancement. Dividing organizations into functions, or let's say the American society become to become so viciously divided between two fractions, Democrats and Republicans, all these things will cri always cripple innovation. You know, racism, uh, prejudice against others, all these things cripple our societies and human advancement. We cannot have that going on anymore. And we can fight it in societies. We must fight it in societies. That's a, a point that um, Mariana Mazzucato also makes. And any economist like myself must make this, point, make this point from time to time. But in organizations, healing organizations will mean to reintegrate integrate functional, you know, instead of having functional division, to reintegrate functions into small teams uh, in the periphery that can run their business in the, independently. And, and th th there's, there's a parallel, so to speak, between what we, are, what we have to achieve in society and what we have to achieve in organizations. And, and, and one example for how to heal an organization would be to make sales departments, human resources departments, which, we, which you mentioned earlier, to make them superfluous uh, and to reintegrate yeah, the into the normal I, work. I think your, your approach is, 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 is very laudable. And I think you're onto something big there. I feel like this is already underway, uh, probably less in Europe than it is in the US. And I agree with you, every company goes, it's probably a hybrid still, uh, because we still, a lot of 
CEOs, a lot of entrepreneurs still have this old model in their mind and they haven't really gotten rid of it. And you, but I think we, we, we got off the wrong track earlier. This doesn't, what I wanted to say, you don't have to be remote, but remote kind of, and you don't have to be freelance. You don't have to be flexible in your working agreements in order to pull this off. It's a way how you approach um, and you, you, you have that, how you approach complexity, how you approach problem solving. So the idea to create small teams is fantastic. I'm not sure it, it lends itself to every type of organization. Um, I know yeah, right. examples you quote right. are, are really interesting. Well, I, I don't know, you're the expert. Um, so no, I, I know that retail chains uh, have an easy time to do this, but the but question is, right. how do you do this? They, uh, let, me, let me give you an example that's probably a little harder. Um, so talk, let's talk about Boeing. So big, widespread, um, sometimes remote, lots of suppliers, um, value chain. How do you think it would work for Boeing? Very well. The secret of organizations, the dirty secret of organizations in a way is that they already consist of many, many small teams that actually create the value and that interact in, yeah, in quasi autonomous ways. These quasi autonomous ways, of course, this, this, this level of self organization is of course hindered by budgeting, org charts, uh, performance appraisals, steering with fixed targets, bonus systems, individualization, uh, you know, uh, all these things. And also, of course, the way that careers are accelerated and, 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 and manufactured and administered in organizations, HR departments, all that crippled self-organization. But Boeing is secretly, secretly, as large as the company may be, it still consists of people, uh, of, uh, of people, of teams that have, I mean, virtually, so to speak, it consists of many, many small teams that interact with each other and that create value for each other with each other. Only that you can see none of that in the org chart. Only that HR knows none of that. Only that department heads and whatever heads and vice presidents, presidents they may have, they sit on a totally different structure, which is functionally divided silos. And the those teams that we are talking about, those actually value creating teams, you know, they are not visible, they are hidden by the org chart, which is why org charts are uh, a crime against value creation, actually. They should be uh, abolished, which is not an obvious thing how to, do, how to achieve that, how to run an organization, 200, 300, 400,000 people maybe, without an org chart, or let's take a million people organization like Walmart. It's not obvious. And I think we are, and, and I think our conversation here is a great example of that in a way you, you doubt, you doubt it, that it's possible. Which is okay. I know that kind of dialogue, you know, that's, oh, I, I doubt that it's possible. You know, you're an expert, but st I still doubt it. I, I always hear that. I've been hearing that for 17 years now. And it's like, it's like let, let, let's imagine uh, a world in which the concept of race is unknown. It's hard to imagine, right? Because now we are all infested by this, this idea of race and division and different, different groups. We are, uh, once an idea like that is in the world, we cannot get rid of it easily. And that's just a, with an with a idea of management with which Frederick Taylor perfected or created even uh, 100, 100 or so years ago. With that idea of management and functional division and the top steering the bottom and dividing between thinkers at the top and doers of, at the bottom, this idea does not fade away easily. These ideas are manifested in so many patterns and tools, some of which we already mentioned, like budgeting, fixed target bonus systems and so on, performance appraisal. Uh, or, or the words, we, we talk of performers, top performers, high performers, low performers, uh, high potentials, low potentials. Hang on, Niels. And so these ideas are so deeply embedded in us, in our concepts in our world words and language business business language even that uh, this this hypothesis that you you offered earlier that there's there's something like um alpha and beta pyramid and peach decentralized organization they are they are living well along inside modern organizations that is unfortunately that is just a beautiful myth our organizations are at best schizophrenic today yeah i think what you describe is is spot on um the question is, I, I think what would you describe, it, it's already happening and it is the future. The question is how, how fast does that roll out and how can we make it faster? So um, I think it happened 
over the last 20 years already. And um, again, I think Silicon Valley was the proponent of this, um, like companies like Google. But we have the same problem now with institutions in the US. I think the exact same problem applies, as you say. There's a schizophrenic inside view um, to what a university is, which is different from the actual value generation and what students want out of a university in the US. The same is true for many schools now, even for high schools, um, all the way down to kindergarten where there's new approaches that exist, but they haven't been adopted by the institutions. And it goes all the way into politics that there is a small core of value generation teams. Um, and Jordan Peterson describes them as there's an 80-20 rule. Um, so there's a very small amount of people in an organization that create the most value and are much more valuable than everyone else. The problem has always been, and I don't know if this your approach can solve this, it's often hard to figure out who are these people? So who are my most productive employees? And who do I really need to support them? And can I let go of everyone else? I think for a lot of organizations that has become completely invisible. And even if they wanted to take that step, they are not able to identify those people within their own ranks. So that's make, make them bloated. And in my mind, very open to you know, political, inflammation, so to speak, they're being compromised by ideology in order to protect their profits. Not that they like one politics or the other much more, but they use this in order to create an additional marketing hype and uh, to make more money out of a broken system, I feel. And I think what you describe, if it would get more, more visibility, it would bring people together because I think the core value proposition of finding these people and having them self-organize and then kind of create a bubble around them, it's wonderful. Yeah, I'm, 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 you, you touched so many, so many issues and, and at, at a certain piece of what you just said, I, I heard Jack Welch from the 1980s or 90s speaking, you know. I've never um, heard Jack Welch. I never well, met maybe, him either. I just well, met maybe him. Maybe something influenced me. Yeah, I think, I think nobody in, in, in US business today is not influenced by Jack Welch. You know, it's, it's, uh, because he represented that corporate heroism for such a long time, I think 30 years, that he, it's, he had a massive influence on, 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 on business people everywhere in the world. So, so it's just that, you know, there are so many echoes from the past ringing, running in, our, in what we say and what we think. And of course, what I'm suggesting, which is not at all my model, by the way, the beta, beta codex is not my model. It is a model that we found uh, around 20 years ago, a movement called Beyond Budgeting, um, the Beyond Budgeting Roundtable founded in organizations that were um, successive at the time and that didn't have budgets and that didn't have command and control and that didn't have org charts and so on. And of course, among the companies that um, this research body, the Beyond Budgeting Roundtable of which I was a director, what we found were organizations like AES from the United States, a wonderful energy company that has diminished, greatly diminished for several reasons. We found companies, of course, uh, like uh, Dell at the time, not so great, you know, in terms of organizational model uh, today, but 20 years ago, it was a great case. Um, we found organizations like Handelsbank and W. L. Gore and so on. And of course, one of the pioneers, Toyota. And I think that's, that would, the, the, you know, taking that as an example for what is happening today and what has happened over the last 50, 60 years in the business world, I think that serves as a great example. Instead of saying, uh, Google created something new, which I, did, I think they didn't, you know, business organization-wise, they didn't. Product-wise, yes. Business-wise, not so much. Um, uh, I think Toyota serves as a great example to where we stand today, you know. Um, John Updike wrote, I think, a, a trilogy of novels, of great novels about the rise of Toyota in the U.S. And, 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 and everybody has heard about Toyota, right? Lean is totally derived from, from Toyota and so, so much else. Actually, the Agile movement and Scrum was already also de derived from uh, Toyota. Everything that, that could be, uh, or most of the things, like let's say 30, 50 percent of what's great and modern in organizations comes in some way from Toyota. Now, here's the thing. Look at the car industry internationally today. The rise, I mean, I would argue that um, Toyota is the perfect beta organization, or one of the perfect examples of a beta organization. They are not perfect, but they are the perfect of the example of a radically decentralized, consistently non-command and control, a consistently not bureaucratic, not hierarchical organization. You know. And here's the thing, we know exactly how Toyota produces cars better than everybody else, makes, you know, is more 
uh, innovative than the conventional car companies. And, and, and the other thing, so we have known all these so-called secrets for decades. Many authors like um, uh, Jeffrey Leica have written books and books and books about it. And I myself wrote a lot about Toyota as well, about the case. However, look at the car companies today, General, Mo uh, General Motors, Ford, Fiat, Volkswagen, even Daimler, BMW, Porsche, they're all very much command and control. They haven't gotten rid of command and control. But because they're still around. How, how do you describe that they're still around? Is that zombie companies? Are they just uh, supported by subsidies? Why are they still around yeah. if they are yeah. so inept at managing? They are not, they are, of course, supported by, um, let's say, considerable uh, um, advantages in terms of taxation and so I mean, they, they, these companies have profited from politics and from lobbying. Here in Germany, for example, uh, Volkswagen, I think, has, still has the bigger, biggest market share. And that is obviously not the case because their cars are so brilliant, because, but because there are certain protectionist you know, uh, 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 patterns in place that promote the success of an organization, not, not, not the success, success really, but the best survival of a company like Volkswagen. And uh, I think General Motors, uh, the whole of Detroit, of course, is no different. Um, if you want to learn something really about the, the epic struggle between command and control, alpha as I call it, and radically decentralized organizations or beta organizations as I call it, read the NAMI case study from the 1980s. NAMI was a factory in, I'm not sure where, Tennessee or something? I'm not sure where it was. NAMI was a factory, a GM factory, with the biggest problems that you can imagine in terms of quality and morale and so on. The worst factory in the General Motors universe. And then in the 80s, uh, I think it started off the 80s, uh, Toyota took 50% uh, share in that factory. And within just 12 or 18 months, they had a stellar performance uh, and their problems with unions and so on and inefficiency, ineffectiveness and with worker, worker strife had gone away. That is one of the most interesting examples, I think, of what a beta organization can achieve and of how it easy it is to become or how little time you need to transform an organization from command and control to beta. Yeah, but you say... Have motors learned anything from that? What you're saying that long term, if a company is better managed, it should create better products at a lower price, right? So we might not see this for a year or two, but as you say, the, the management structure can be changed and it's relatively quick transformation in terms of you know KPI, KPIs. Shouldn't we see this rollout kind of self-propelled? Um, if we, 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 it's a new technology, so to speak, a new management technology, and it's been around for 20 years, which isn't a ton of time, but it is a bit of time, and Toyota, you know, has probably done this for 50 years, as you say. Shouldn't yeah, it have out-competed everything else? Let, let's not, let's not, let's not, uh, I, I just want to, want to stop you from, from, I want to stop us from, from creating misperceptions. Um, beta, the Beta Codex, or the concept that I'm talking about, the name, that is recent. The Beta Codex Network was founded in 2008, but the model as I tried to explain, is older. It goes back to the 1970s in the case of Handelsbanken and W.L. Gore. It goes back to the 1980s, 1980s in the case of Semco, a Brazilian company that is a stellar example of democratic organization. It goes back to the 1950s and 60s in the case of Toyota. So um, this kind of radically self-organized, decentralized organizations have existed for a long, long time. In fact, when the um, social dynamics movement was uh, in was founded on the American East Coast. Um, and its instigators were people like Kurt Levine and so on. Uh, and, um, when the T groups, the social dynamics movement were founded. Um, at the time, uh, the, the scientists behind those initiatives, they of course also looked at the marketplace and tried to find organizations that were radically decentralized at the time. One organization they found, that was in the 1950s, I think, in mid-1950s or so, one of the most dramatically decentralized and democratized organizations in the world they found was a British coal mine. Of course, that doesn't, the company doesn't exist anymore in this shape. But at the time, in the 1950s, there were already radically decentralized beta organizations around, only that we had little understanding of the laws behind those models. Few people really understand what's behind the organizational model of Toyota. Toyota people, uh, the sensei at least at uh, Toyota, have a great way of explaining it, but it's little understood 
often ignored, you know, the, the uh, often often we reduce the the greatness about organizational models such as that of Toyota or Google until the nineteen until nineteen uh, two thousand eleven or so. Often we confuse the organizational model with the tools or practices they use. For example, uh, these days, 2021, we have something of a hype, at least in Germany, I'm not sure how it's in, in the United States, around OKRs, which supposedly made Google great, which is just utter nonsense. OK, OKRs, the method about targets and objectives, that was Can always... Can explain what that is? Uh, I don't think uh, people know it, what that is. I, I don't know either. Objectives and key results. It's, 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 it's a ridiculous steering and monitoring uh, method that Google has been using since, since its early days. And they took it from, I think, they discovered it, that method at Intel uh, in the 1990s. So uh, Intel has been one of the pioneers of that method and Google uh, applied it. Again, in my opinion, it was always the worst, worst, worst practice and tool that Google used. And they were all successful until, you know, in spite of that bullshit, uh, not because of it. And today it's, there's a certain hype and certain scene around that of people fooling themselves that um, the fixed targets and those indicator systems, which are heavily, uh, heavily um, you know, that must be worked heavily, that require heavy investment, heavy overhead, and that uh, accomplish nothing. Many people fool themselves that the methods make organizations successful. And that is one of the myths of businesses and organizations. It's never the tools. I mean, a fool with a tool is still a tool, you say in English. And uh, that's a brilliant way to put it. Tools change nothing. However, we need more democratic, more federalist principles in organizations to accomplish more decentralized, more self-organized, more consistently market-driven organizations, which are necessary to success, succeed in a complex world and complex markets. And that's the point I'm making in my books and my, my talks. You know. The world has changed. It changed in the 1970s or 80s. The latest, we're not in the industrial age anymore, so we need appropriate organizational models and organizations have not transformed to that by and large. By and large. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's tough for these organizations that have been around for a long time to make that transformation, especially if they're still profitable. I think the ultimate determination is usually, are you still profitable? Uh, these days, you can always go um, to Congress and try to get a bailout. But before that, you know, that was the ultimate impetus to look at things, what we could change and experiment with. And I, unfortunately, this is one of my big themes. This um, force to 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 drive change in your own organization has been reduced by all this fake money, by another round of QE, by more inflation. Um, that's a real problem. I think maybe that that hindered the rollout of, of new management technologies probably as well as, as it um, hindered entrepreneurship. One thing I wanted to ask you, and I was having um, a special forces, former um, special forces um, veteran on the show a couple of uh, episodes ago. And they have, um, you know, the Army or the Navy have a very, very restrictive top-down system. But it ends um, usually at the, the team that's actually, like special forces, the team that's actually in the battlefield. Those are very autonomous. Um, there's a huge um, training effort that they go through uh, that actually isn't training, but it's selecting people who have the right talent um, to, to, because they are recruiting 18-year-olds to put them in a very... Um, changing, very diverse battlefield, they need to find people who can adapt to this and still perform under that pressure. So what, what they've been coming up with is they kept that old organization of the Navy or the Army in place, the military, but then created these bubbles of high autonomy um, around that to make these teams as effective as possible. Do you think that's a model that works uh, consistently or is just a hybrid that we see for a while? And is that something that uh, corporations also should look at? Yeah, I, I, um, uh, the narrative you just offered, I think it, it is, there are misperceptions in it. And uh, the narrative that you offered is that military today is a hybrid between centralization, decentralization, maybe, or so on. But I think it's not, that's not the case at all. I think the military has been a pioneer of de decentralization, consistent decentralization. Of course, in, a, in an organization that uh, requires its employees to ultimately face death, um, you need, there are some variations of the pattern of how to organize and how to, you know, what, what are the kind of rituals that you need in that kind of organization to keep it, you know, consistent. Uh, so uh, rank, 
for example, of course, in the military is very important, which doesn't mean it's a command and control organization. And I think that's the core misunderstanding that you was embedded in your question. The, the fact that um, military is, high, is strong in rank and status does not mean that it is command and control. Okay. In fact, if you look at the research done by organizations on decentralization, you will find that the American military was uh, pumped, I'm not sure how much money, but definitely millions in researching decentralization in the 1960s and 70s. Why? Because, of course, the American military suffered such brutal failures, you know, brutal defeats, starting in the Korean War. I mean, every war after World War II, the Americans lost it. No, more and more money was spent, but all the military efforts failed. You know, Korea, the Korean War, some in between. I mean, Afghanistan, utter failure as well, the whole thing, uh, disastrous. But also Vietnam. Now, I think Vietnam um, w promoted a, a, certain, a certain shift in perception that decentralization was necessary. Because, of course, um, that general who was also at Ford and then went to the World Bank, what was his name? Mac McNamara. McNamara was the epitome, you know, the hero of centralized decision making, of theory. And the McNamara ideal of, we just pump the double of soldiers into that country, Vietnam, and then we will have the double results. None of that was true. It's like you cannot scale war. We already discussed scaling and McNamara ultimately proved that you cannot scale success, that you can scale an organization, you cannot scale a war and so on. So after that, the Vietnam disaster, and not in the Trumpish sense, but an actual disaster. After that experience, the military researched decentralization profoundly. And many thinkers from the field of cybernetics, Margaret Wheatley, for example, they, their, their research or their insight came from this kind of research and you know, programs in the military to discover how, what decentralization could look like. What we now have is military operations everywhere in the world with soldiers that are highly, you know, that's why we call, talk about intel all the time, because every soldier must be informed in the field. There are beautiful movies about decentralization in the in the military, one of the one one of the movies I like best is Black Hawk Down. I always remember remember watching Black Hawk Down, not because it's such a great story, but because the the helplessness of the general in, in who's in charge, who's in command, in a situation where utter defeat is happening in the in the field in Somalia, I, if I remember well, that is is so so perfectly so crisply shown in that movie. I always recommend to understand decentralization in the military. I always recommend Black Hawk Down because it's such, it, it's so, it, ha, it, it has a strong message that goes well beyond the firing. So what the American military learned in the 1970s was decentralization, you know, putting the soldier in charge. There are many, many movies about that. One is with Jake Gyllenhaal, that's fantastic as well in a way. <laughs> Now, organizations, corporations have not done the same. And that is a tragic. The military has accomplished decentralization. And I'm not saying that military operations are perfect or that there are no ethical questions around. I'm not saying that. But organizational model-wise, they have decentralized. Corporations, by and large, haven't. So we, are still, we, we still need to see that. And the big, big problem is that markets became more complex, more dynamic, more globalized in the 1970s and 80s, and most corporations haven't done anything to decentralize. We still run the same command and control bullshit models, epitomized, for example, by sales departments, HR departments running the show, by heads of business and COOs supposedly running the business. I like, I like your analysis. I think it's spot on. And we, we find it now, which is, I find kind of backwards. So when I was talking to Mike Sorrell, who is a former Navy CEO, he runs a company now that teaches companies about recruiting because he's applying the, the, the training and the, 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 the leadership um, analysis that um, special forces do to a company. And he says, you, you can do this. You, you don't have to go. Well, he, he broils it down, but I think he, you guys should talk because you, you, you look at the same problem, but in a different, very different perspective, very, through a very different prism. He, he looks at it through the recruiting angle and says, basically, they're recruiting the wrong people. They're recruiting basically people who fake their CVs um, or fake their, their interviews because they're looking for specific skills that they might have or might not have, but it doesn't say anything about their performance. So that's what he calls talent. And I think this comes out in this game of decentralization. And I found this kind of ironic that, and this might be your point all along, that 
you know, something where you feel like it is an industry or is, as a whole is something relatively flexible, which is the world economy or the US economy. But I think we have this problem in a lots of places that they have to learn recruiting from the military, which is a bureaucratic superstructure um, with millions of, of layers of bureaucracy in between. I find this very ironic. Yes, the business world is struggling with where to learn from, where to find the great examples. And the I think the sad reality is that the best run organizations are the most boring ones. Great organizations, which is why Tesla can never be a good company. And it isn't a good company. It is it is not boring enough. You know, it's not doing business. That's what, what becomes visible every day, I think. If you read about what, what, what supposedly is going on at those hype companies, or let's take Airbnb or uh, Airbnb, which is the next Groupon, of course, and, and Tesla is the next Enron. And it's so visible because they're so overhyped, so sexy. A, a really cool company, Toyota, Handelsbank, they're not sexy. Nothing interesting, nothing fancy is going on. The, corporate, the CEO, man or woman, is not a hero. And that's a good company. A good company is boring, you know, except of the occasional real innovation that's happening at Toyota, for example. Uh, of course, they are capable of innovating, and there are some, like, some sexy moments. But um, a command and control organization from the outside looks much, much more appealing, more attractive. Heroism sells. It also sells to media. And the sad reality, I think, is that due to this like mis, misguidance of our attention, we look at the wrong... Uh, places, for examples, uh, and I agree with you. We shouldn't exactly look at the military for recruiting practices because it's it's no no it's not it's not a business. You know? um, if you are a business, I think you should look at companies like um, Southwest Airlines, Handelsbank, and WL Gore, and so on, and also Google until you know the the twenty twenties. Uh, or until the 2010s, I, I want to say. If you look at those companies, how they recruited, you find interesting patterns. For example, HR played no role in the whole process. Of course. Yeah, which is very important. Never let HR people filter or decide. I have seen this firsthand how HR people have no clue of how to filter out. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, this, I, I'll be 100% agree. I think any entrepreneur I talk to says the same thing. HR That's the biggest enemy inside the company. Yeah, no, yeah, I, yeah. Okay, I don't want to blame HR people either, but uh, but here's the thing. But by if definition, HR it's not the people. It's the, 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 the role in the organization. It's not necessarily the people. The people might be just fine. So, of course, the wisest principle for recruitment for selection for hiring people should be teams hiring new peers or peer recruiting or peer peer to peer recruiting or however you want to call it we call it peer recruiting or teams recruiting new members yeah. and and of course uh, which this is something i learned from google it is very wise to add to that the right of the CEO or CEOs also to veto a recruitment decision i heard of examples where uh, larry or sergey um, stopped hiring processes of individual people because they always had the right to revise, to be the last people to revise the, the formalities, the, the papers, the paperwork, the documentation from the recruiting process. And they sometimes um, rejected candidates. They were, they were never allowed to you know, hire people that would be rejected by the business. But after you know, 7, 12, or 20 people had interviewed the candidates, they would review the process and had the right to reject. And then what, what people in the business could do is to start the whole thing over and over again. But again, going through all the recruitment phases, I, by the way, I, my ex-wife, she went through all this. So I know this firsthand how this worked. And it worked. That's a good process. Peer recruiting, that's the best process there is, which doesn't mean that for example, CEOs ha wouldn't have no say in the process. It means that everyone who does a recruitment interview had the, has the same right to reject a candidate. And that's the only decision that matters, to reject candidates that you don't want inside your team, inside your, having inside your organization. And this kind of highly democratic recruiting process, it's not at all pervasive in organizations. Much the contrary. I, I, from what I see in organizations, and I see a lot of organizations, Still, CEOs recruit alone, managers recruit alone, guided and aided by HR, who understand nothing of the business usually. So we still have very much command control process also of promotion. If I see that we're still doing assessment centers and recruitment centers and how are they called? Promotion centers, you know, these kind of standardized tests 
which are among the most bullshit command control rituals that you can, the most, the most hypocrite rituals in business. Uh, next yeah, I mean, to you want, can maybe make that argument that a lot of these things are, if I compare it to psychology or, uh, you know, the, the way people look at the human mind changes every five years. Right now, the big five is a big deal. Um, there was Greg Myers before. There were, there were all kinds of tools, but they kind of go through these phases. And I think in companies, because they have so much trouble to identify who are actually those 20% who are really the effective people, who do I need to support them, they go through phases where they kind of tried tons of different tools, but without really taking them seriously, without really wanting any real change, because what they, what they feel like, everything works, because, I mean, the company makes money. This is what the shareholders incorporated these companies for. But they, they kind of want to go th cycle through a number of different tools that kind of keep them innovative on the surface. But I think the real management innovation and the stuff you described for some companies, this is like a wall change for a lot of companies, for startups, I don't think it is. But for, for, for a lot of companies, I can see this is an enormous change. I almost feel they're not interested in this. You have to rebuild most of those companies from scratch to get the people into that mindset. And um, See, that's that why we have, have competition, right? For this, we have capitalism. The old companies need to die, and more productive companies need, yeah, to, so need to grow up. And they need to be more productive. Yeah, okay, you are throwing so many hypotheses on me. It's 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 hard to keep it keep the keep track of things. That's the whole idea. Yeah, yeah. You, you're the master of confusion. You know, you're confused. Mm -hmm. I get dizzy. <laughs> But I also, I'm also enchanted by your... <laughs> You're doing very well. You're doing very well. <laughs> and also, I, uh, let's not forget, we're not supposed to be taking ourselves too seriously in this, pot, in this, in this session. Uh, so so <laughs> let me just subjectively choose one of the topics that you just... Uh, of course. Of course. I would argue that we, we um, in, in, business, in the world of business, we're lacking uh, theory, robust theory, and we're lacking conviction. We're lacking willpower. Yeah. And let me let me again use the the, um, the beloved country, uh, the country I love so much, the United States of America, as an example. It took it took very intelligent, brutally smart people to make up democracy and to fight for us, fight for it. Sadly, in the United States, only the men are remembered, and not so much the the many women who played an important role in establishing, inventing democracy and in establishing it. Uh, Democracy has a long history, long history, and it took democracy. Let's say, let's say, even the French Revolution, of course, wasn't the starting point of democracy. It was just one of the momentums, one of the notable historic moments. And then these, you know, thinking, um, uh, thinking, the writing of the Constitution in America. I went to Philadelphia to to see these and to Washington to see the, the important documents as well and the important uh, sites, um, of course. So uh, if you look at at the history of democracy, which is really a thing that's in the flow all the time. We must reinvent and update democracy all the time. This kind of invention of a consistent model for our time of governing societies, in this case, self-governing of the people, we the people being in charge, something like that hasn't happened in the business world. The only true philosopher, the only big philosopher that we have in the world of business is Frederick Taylor, maybe, another guy from Philadelphia, another guy from the United States. And he gave us command and control 100 years ago, which is not his fault, because at the time, American democracy was not perfect. And I mean, as son of a, or as a Quaker or, you know, son of a, a, a woman who protected um, slaves, you know, to, to, uh, and hid away slaves to, to hide them from a short death. I think Frederick Taylor was a political per a person. He had a social ideal, um, but the means that he came up with as an engineer to make organizations more just, more fair, more balanced, um, more, let's say, society promoting, oh, more democracy promoting, they, they were imperfect. And I think we cannot blame Frederick Taylor for being imperfect, you know, and for being a child of his time. I blame us. I think we are the problem. You know, not Frederick Taylor, um, not even Jack Welch. Uh, I think we are the problem because our societies are far more democratic uh, than they were at Frederick Taylor's time, and we haven't even remotely tried to make them more democratic. That's what I've, I'm fighting for. That's why I invite everyone, also you, Torsten, of course, to, to join the Beta Codex movement. And ultimately, it's a movement for making organizations more federalized, more decentralized, more democratic, more up for complexity and fit for human beings. And of course, with, you know, 
to strengthen the conditions to sustain value creation, which includes innovation, from my point of view. So that is what what the challenge. Yeah, I, I think we're we're we're, we're definitely um, we're pulling the same string. I feel you, you have a different terminology and a different yeah yeah um, different to. way to look at the world, and which I, which I think is awesome. Um, I want want to hear all about it. Um, there, there's a lots of points of where, where I feel like I, I would disagree, and I think I see the world differently. And uh, but that doesn't mean that we, we, we both think this is this is the goal. Um, going but, towards um, let me let me a way to empower people is fantastic. The the the, the problem always is, and I think corporation uh, exemplified this so well. And I think you you made that point earlier. And I want to talk about the hero myth. Um, what what you see as the hero myth um, is. And, mar and the U.S. has been so good at, at marketing and sales their whole life, uh, especially marketing. And what that is is basically creating a narrative and making it convincing and then finding a channel that transports it to people in a convincing manner that used to be TV, it used to be radio, now it's the Internet. And it's these themes uh, that come up in social media. Those are, in my mind, it's just the, the former strength of, of American marketing genius, of really talented marketers in the U.S., that have taken those narratives. And the hero myth is one that's inbuilt in all of us. So we respond to it. There's lots of other core narratives and archetypes we respond to. And people have used those and hijacked those, set it up with, with really cheap AI, and now push people into these, I don't want to say boxes, but into these realities of their own, where they're kind of helpless because there's so much information, there's so much AI that, that pre- um, determines information and selects it for them, not necessarily nef with a nefarious idea, but in a way that these, these, the, like the, the, like the hero myth are being recycled for pure marketing gig and everything wants, everyone wants to market something, right? Donald Trump wants to market himself and his corporation. They, you want to appeal to voters, you want to buy stuff, you want to, want to travel, you want to buy another uh, Netflix account, like the, the amount of marketing that's going on in the U.S., and now this is on the world scale, but it's obviously the grand zeros here in the U.S., your reality is kind of like like in the movie, like Minority Report, you're constantly surrounded by marketing messages, and at some point you don't even know, like CNN is a pure marketing message now, obviously it's, it doesn't sell computers or phones, it sells a political affiliation. And these things, what happened is we, we've used those archetypes like the hero myth, and companies have hijacked those to just wrap it around a lot of bullshit. I fully agree with you. But it doesn't mean that these narratives are bad or, and, and it doesn't mean that marketing is that. It's just, it's, I actually don't know how the human mind right now and like unprotected, it doesn't have their own AI, how the human mind can, can make sense of information anymore because there's so much out there by like really powerful data giants that just, it screws your reality. All of us see a different reality and it gets really tricky to find out even in a conversation with an open mind and very few people do this anymore we've what is actually the overarching picture of reality this is like the real problem we see with these bullshit companies that's why they, they thrive right because they have the ability to screw reality for a lot of people yeah let me let me overlook that you claimed in what you just said you i think you claimed that the telephone and tv and the internet were invented in the united states i will just not no, no, not invented. Uh, that okay. it's something that they're, they're being sold, not invented. But here's the thing: you asked me. I didn't talk about inventions at all. And okay. that's a, I didn't try to. Maybe it came out the wrong way. But I think you, 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 we circled. You circled back to the, the uh, question that matters. So many things are said. So many things are believed. There's so much, such a big burden from the past in businesses and in societies and in our beliefs and so on. And education systems promote beliefs that seem strange today. Um, so how to sort the whole thing? And this is exactly the point of the work that I do. So I, please allow me to, 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 to offer a, a possible solution. I think the solution is practical the theory. The solution is practical theory. And uh, this is something that I got from Kurt Levine, who coined this expression, practical theory. He said that nothing, there's nothing as practical as good theory. If the world spins faster, which it doesn't really, but if the world seems to spin faster to us because we are so overwhelmed by information and, and, and supposed innovation and concepts and stuff that comes up and, and the internet accelerates everything, in the face of this kind of acceleration of information flow, at least, and maybe even of innovation, in the face of all this, we need 
theory. We need, we need a will, our, will our, our wanting, our will must be uh, in, it must be subjected to a higher purpose. And that is why I talked so uh, extensively a couple of minutes ago about democracy. Only if you feel in your heart that democracy is the only way and, for, and that the price of democracy in the US must be union first and second comes as a consequence, the abolition of slavery. And so on. that's when you become Abraham Lincoln. You need the theory, the understanding of what democracy is and what defines it, which you beautifully told, talked about, and also of the consequence. So only if you have a theory that's in your heart that becomes a higher purpose or a conviction, a belief of sorts, or let's say a strife, you know, uh, only then can you judge what's there. And this I, is agree, the I agree. This is this is beautiful, but I yeah. don't think democracy is the right layer to look at. And if you look into the founding fathers, Benjamin Franklin always said, you know, democracy is basically two wolves and one lamb trying to figure out what they're going to have for lunch. Uh, so, yes, it's, it's for incredible. Benjamin Franklin, democracy was a was a tool uh, to to use in order to drive prosperity and to drive um, a process of we. American happiness or world happiness, so to speak. But he notices how vulnerable that is, and it is bound by, by deeper layers of belief. No, no, I think you mis misinterpret Benjamin Franklin. But that's exactly, well, I mean, that's what the quote says, right? Yeah, no, 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 yeah, yeah. Okay, the quote says one thing, but you interpret it is in that it is fragile. Democracy isn't fragile. The robustness of democracy lies in the capability of democracy to absorb the the conflicts and the dilemmata, the paradoxes, the different interests, that is the strength of democracy. What makes democracy far more robust than authoritarianism on the other side, or fascism or Stalinism or whatever kind of authoritarianism or dictatorship you have to choose. Democracy, and the same goes for capitalism or marketing economy, Cap market economy being the actual thing and capitalism is just a, a fighting fighting word, you know, to, to make it look dangerous and bad. But what market economies and democracies have in common, that they are the best system to absorb in a, in a strife and riddles of in complexity and surprise and advancement, uh, advancements. They are capable of updating much better and faster than any other, any other form of government on the one side, side or uh, let's say, economic system on the other. That's why market economies are superior to planned economies. They are much more likely to absorb the complexities and the conflicts within. And democracies are much better than fascism and Trump authoritarianism because um, democracy can always absorb the new conflicts and the new. So what Benjamin Franklin, I think, explained was the nature of democracy and not its fragility. Uh, and, and this is very important always to, to, to try to understand the context. Benjamin Franklin, of course, in the context of his time, so much conflict in the world, so much strife and suffering, human suffering, physical suffering. You and I, we, don't, we, don't know, know, we know nothing. We know shit about that experience of always have your life endangered, you know, especially in the United States at the time. So uh, I understand where the founding fathers came from, where the language, it's important for us to understand where the language comes from, where the, the the concept come from what the context of their, you know, articulations were. And they, I think, um, both Benjamin Franklin uh, and, and the other founding fathers, they did a great job in explaining to the American people what democracy would be about. I think, I think you have a very, how do I say that, Eurocentric view on uh, American democracy and the, the, the ideals I, I shared this, or I used to share this, you know, I, I grew up in Germany, I, I shared the same exact worldview. I feel this is, there's more to it. And um, the, the way Greeks and Aristotle, Socrates, Plato, how they've been dealing with democracy, and obviously that's a very different time, but the moral issues are the same. Um, the, the, there was obviously a, a different culture and there was a different technology around. And democracy was a different animal, even if it has the same name. I, that's, I fully agree with this. But I think what democracy needs, and I, I also agree with you that it is a risk-reducing um, ability. There's more information in a, in a democracy. It is adjusting itself much quicker than anything else. Fully agree with this. But it doesn't mean it is the best solution necessarily. Um, then we can't explain Singapore, right? Um, Singapore has been a success story without being a democracy. We can't explain China 
which has been an economic success story. Well, you can't. Being a democracy. Let me, let, okay. let me out of that. You cannot explain the success. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, you, you need to explain it to me. That's what I wanted to say. No, I, I don't. I can't I don't, explain it. I mean, I, I don't need to because I understand it. You know, I, don't, I understand it. If you want to understand it, it's it's good to. You know, I'm currently reading a book. It's so funny that you 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 uh, you said that my view of uh, the um, invention of democracy was U.S. Uh, centered or U.S. focused, which is Eurocentric. funny. Eurocentric. 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 Yes, like 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 the the way I perceive this, and obviously this the, this is no, just my own learning. No, no, no. no. Uh, I think this is too high, too high. Um, no, no. I, I lived in I lived in Brazil for twelve years in the United States for five years. I lived in Argentina and in Spain as well. So I lived in five countries all in all, and and I'm, I'm not just as a tourist. I mean, uh, I, I studied the, the cultures and the history as well. I had the opportunity to to study that, and uh, so no, um, no. No, uh, I might not okay. be very uh, heavy on understanding Africa also, or, um, and I have only been to to Asia quite a few, well, quite a few times to Singapore as well. By the way, which teaches you a lot about the 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 cost that the lack of consistent democracy puts on a country. Uh, it's it's healthy, I think, to to go there and to see what what's the price. Yeah. Um, I also tell, tell me about your time in Brazil. Um, I know you spent a lot of time there. Uh, <clears throat> would, would, excuse me. Would you go back? Or what do you think of Brazil as a as a political animal, uh, um, as a political animal, not enemy, as a as an economy that always seems to be on the on the verge of exploding to a much higher level, but somehow doesn't. What do you think? Uh, what is the real history of Brazil and of what's going to be the future uh, from your own perspective? It's a it's a tough question to uh, to answer in, in just a few minutes, but uh, I think there are two two. Um, we have time. We have time. Yeah, we have time. <laughs> it's there are two typical sayings which I think uh, illustrate the matter. Uh, every Brazilian will tell you, especially as a foreigner, will tell you that uh, that Brazil is something like God's chosen country. The expression is very similar to that. Uh, 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 it's 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 the country where God would want to live, and God would not want to live in any. Okay, they're Catholics, right? You, so, but, um, fundamentally, every Brazilian is deeply convinced that Brazil is the only place where you can live. Brazilians also think of themselves as a little bit smarter as everybody else. That's a characteristic. I think that um, it's it's very important. It's something that we in Germany do not have so much. To believe that we Germans are smarter than everybody else. I mean, many of us think that, especially men, of course. But the I feel Germany has a huge superiority complex. So does China. There's a, there's a, a small yeah. number of nations that have a huge but superiority Germany, complex. Our superiority complex is beautifully combined with the inferiority complex of having begun and lost two successive world wars. You know? That definitely so, helped. That definitely helped rein in the ego. But uh, I that, think France has it too. That is, I think it's a, a short list of really high um, superiority complexes. And Brazil supposedly never fought a war, which is not true. They fought a war, a bloody war against Paraguay once. Mm -hmm. There's no nothing of that. Nothing. I wrote an entire book about it because I found it so interesting. So Brazilians are bestowed with also, which is something very similar to America, bestowed with the um, with the perception that their country is the only thing that matters. Hardly any at any point would an American say, "I must learn another language." Japanese, Spanish, oh no, Spanish is just for, just for janitors, right? So this this perception of we are alone, we are a fucking island, and everything else is very small in comparison, and we hardly ever touch it. That is a characteristic that Brazil and America share. Uh, Brazil is continental massive, just as the United States. Uh, so the perception that we are here, it's God's country. Uh, this is a very, it's, it's a very peculiar um, setting. And another interesting thing, which for me at least, I'm always talking, of course, from a born in Germany, uh, living in, in, in a country like Brazil. I lived in Spain and Argentina before, but then I moved to Brazil 12 years. Yeah. So, of course, my own view is biased and has 
peculiar. No, but you must have liked that, right? I mean, there's a reason oh, you yeah. stayed there for such oh, a long time. Oh, I love it. I think it's, it's, it's uh, exhilarating. But here's the, the other interesting thing. And you just already mentioned that very, very, um, very briefly, but it was very to the point. Brazil is the, a Brazilian thinker said, or a musician or artist said that. Brazil is always the country of your future. It's the eternal country of the future. The next yeah. decade, Brazil has everything that's needed. That's also combined with this notion that it's God's country. Brazil has everything to be successful. The people, the richness of, you know, nature, the vastness of nature, uh, the, the resources and so on. So always, Brazilians always think that the future is their time. And the future never comes, you know, that future never comes. Mm -hmm. In the present, Brazil hardly ever manages to exploit what's there. The dream of the future is always, always what prevails, which is, of course, a sad thing. And uh, I think uh, America is on the route to falling into the same kind of trap, right? To become a country, eternal country of the future again, you know, make America great again. That's the first, the first sign of the same. Yeah, thing. well, I think we we have that spirit about. Um, the, we were very optimistic about the future, and I think this is an Old Testament and New Testament spirit um, that's that's very strong. And I think this is actually a strength. So I think we disagree on this. I, I, I definitely see this in Brazil as well. Um, for me, my experience in Brazil. And I don't speak a lot of Spanish or Portuguese, so I, I was a little bit in trouble just communicating with people, especially if I went up north. So the northern communities, Fortaleza, Recife, uh, Manaus, um, I found them really interesting cities. I found a little, I was surprised how little English there is, um, but that's my fault, um, so to say. And uh, I found that people are friendly, but they aren't the friendliness, that the stereotype friendliness that I had in my mind, right? Um, I went to Brazil like 10 times, and every time I felt like, man, this place is quite different than it is in my imagination. And again, this might be my, my, my flawed imagination that I had of Brazil. Um, it is an enjoyable country to an extent, but it's, it's very frustrating. Um, a, a lot of things are, there's a lot of areas that are really extremely poor, and you need to, uh, you can obviously circumvent them, kind of like South Africa. But you, and the U.S. has the same problem, not to the same extent, but has the same problem. You need to take a lot of planning as a non-insider. Where do you go? At what point of time? What do you do when the sun is down? What do you, which neighborhood can you go? Where can you cross the street? I found this exhausting. Um, yeah. I, I yeah. loved a lot of places, yeah. but I found this fact exhausting, maybe because I'm such a newbie. And once you get used to it, that's probably not a big deal. And also you go to the, let's say, you went to you, the, the locations, the cities that you mentioned, the Northeast. You went to, I went to Rio too and Sao Paulo. You went to Sao Paulo as well? Yeah, yeah, I went all over. I went a bunch of times. Yeah. So I live but in only Sao for Paulo. short visits. So I'm, I'm certainly not an expert. Uh, again, but the communication issues really tripped me up. You don't have that problem in Sao Paulo. Everyone is, is as fluent in English as I am. Yeah, you have to be that I don't speak Portuguese, which I speak. I speak Portuguese, I speak French, Spanish fluently. Uh, so my, my experience is totally different from yours. Yeah, I can but imagine. I had, had the expectation that you had. Oh, it's a. It's a it's an easy-going country. I've seen the news about Copacabana Beach, the big, you know, the, the women, the women, the, the, the lush women. Well, I wouldn't go that far, but I thought the people are... Yeah, I mean, you're talking from... I don't know, they have, like, something Mexican, you know, Mexicans are very friendly yeah. people. They're, they're, they're kind of re reclusive, but they're always friendly. I didn't feel that was the same in Brazil. They weren't, they weren't Russians, but they weren't progressive and arrogant, but they weren't not friendly. I wouldn't use that word, but they were joyful, for sure. But look, uh, Tos, you are talking from Cancun right now, right? That's correct, yeah. I saw Cancun, and my girlfriend and I, we said, run. We would never stay there. I would never stay in Cancun. Never, ever. For me, it's the least interesting, least compelling city in, in Mexico. I would I never... Agree. I fully really agree. I'm only here for the beaches. Um, yeah, I've been yeah, yeah, yeah. pretty That's much any city in Mexico. <laughs> If this you want to go to the country, don't go to Cancun, because Cancun oh, is enclave, an American enclave. It's like going to Spain, going to Mallorca and expecting or to the worst beaches in, in Mallorca, because Mallorca has a beautiful beaches and the capital, Palma. Is Fully beautiful. agreed, yes. But if you, if you stay in the, in the beaches, the touristy beaches, you will only meet, you know, the Dutch and the Germans and the British. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, so, that's why I ventured out all in, in the cities and, you know, pretty much any neighborhood that I, I had the guts to go in, in, in Brazil. Which, which circles us back to where would I go to find America? I, I, this was my quest, living in, having an apartment in Manhattan. 
For, on 42nd Street for a couple of years. You don't. You won't find it there, and you won't find it in San Francisco either. Exactly. Exactly. Of course, everybody said, "Well, Manhattan. That's not America." So I went to, went around, and I found it. I found it. Uh, I found it in all those places. Actually, I found America in, in all those places, and. Um, but of course, America, in a way, it doesn't exist, of course, as many poets say, you know, uh, many, many American poets have already said, in a way, America is just a narrative as well. And uh, nobody understands the South and nobody understands California if you aren't from there and so on. Yeah. But in a way, of course, you find the country in all of those locations, you find the the. the, the sure the common myths and the common narratives everywhere in that country. From and the places said, you lived at, if, if you are a young person in, in their 20s, you, you, you read a lot of philosophy, you might become an entrepreneur, you're not really sure what to do. Where would you, would you send someone like that? Um, would you send them to Argentina, Brazil, the US, Russia, Germany? Well, what would be your, your first prerogative? Where would these people learn the most? As Oscar Wilde once said, um, you can only know a country if you know two countries. So if you are a young American and you want to understand your country, live in another country, it doesn't matter which one. I wouldn't, my philosophy was always, I wouldn't want to live in the Netherlands or in Denmark to discover what German identity, what German culture and so on is, you know, it's, it, it felt too close to me. When I had the opportunity to do a, a traineeship in Denmark, I, I, I respectfully declined the invitation because I was more, you know, driven by. Uh, I wanted to understand cultures that would be a little more, you know, distanced in a way. The, which, which, which is how I ended up uh, doing a traineeship in Argentina in Buenos Aires, and that was indeed very, very helpful. You know, you would travel until the end of the world. And the first thing that my Argentinian hosts or friends told me was. Welcome to the butt of the world. Bienvenido al culo del mundo. That was so beautiful. Oh, we come at the world's butt. Uh, and, and, and of course, living in such a country, working in such a country teaches you a lot about a, a totally different perception of the world. That was what I found so, so compelling. Of course, I learned a lot about the, 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 the Falklands War in Argentina as well, which is not something that Argentinians like to discuss with strangers. And, and, and it's not exactly convenient to listen to the narratives that Argentinians have developed about the Falkland Wars. Same goes for, you know, talking to British about the Falkland Wars. And uh, so I think it doesn't matter where you go. Every country is great. Every country is fantastic. Uh, the fantasticness of your own culture and country, you can only understand if it, I think, once you lived abroad. You lived as a couple. Yeah, that's definitely very wise. Uh, you know, I, 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 my goal is still to go to every single country, and not just country, just to you know, major region in the world. I do yeah, find don't these countries. Waste your time in Cancun, pal. Mm -hmm. Then don't don't waste your time in Cancun. Oh, I've never been to Cancun before, and uh, I was uh, really curious about the pyramids. No, I've been to any major city in Mexico before, and that's just the spot I always avoided because of. You know, it's too ruined by tourists, and it is, but it kind of isn't. So you can still find spots um, that are decent, let's put it this way. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, there is what I found are countries and places that make it easier for you, um, not knowing the language perfectly. Um, and as you say, it might not matter much because in the end, you know, if, if your goal is to really venture out, you will have to see all those places. So it kind of doesn't matter where you start. That's true. It, it kind of has that inherent risk that you get um, too put off by something they really don't like. Um, so what, what people always, there's like a hierarchy typically of people that are, you know, more more of a long-term um, satisfaction that they deliver you, but they're hard um, to digest in the, in the first place. And I felt Brazil is one good example for this. People who, who stayed there longer, they immensely enjoy it. People who only see it for a limited amount of time, just a few weeks, they are not so sure if this is for them. So I think there is this point where you kind of have to jump over a hump and then you really enjoy other countries massively. Yes. I feel the same is true for Russia, for instance. I uh, Even though I speak the language, I find it hard to 
to adjust the, the Russian way of life. But once you're there, once you and I kind of see life through the through the angle of the locals, it becomes a different animal and and quite satisfying to be there. Yeah, I studied cultural acculturation, cultural integration, so to say. Um, I studied that. I researched it. And I gave trainings about cultural integration and reintegration during my years when I studied at university. I was part of IESEC, an international students' organization, which did change programs. And so uh, there was a great, um, great efforts were made to. It's not part of Interrail, is it? It is what? It's not part of Interrail. Interrail? That for me is a train ticket that you can have. In, it is, in but it's this, you know. Let, the, the 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 one thing every American does to go to Europe is get an interrail ticket. That used to be the case twenty years ago, and see Europe. Yeah. So yeah. that was a very limited experience. No, I guess it, I guess it does student exchange uh, based on traineeship. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so I did I did the traineeship with them in Argentina, for example, and of course there are trainees incoming and outgoing uh, within that association, and we wanted always to train the outgoing students, the Germans, for you know, to prepare them for the experience of living in another country. And it connects very nicely with what you just said. Of course, the first two weeks in another country are either bliss or disappointment or whatever, but it is really irrelevant for the working experience because once you overcome the initial uh, organizational trivial reaction, so to say, and once you, as a trainee, for example, which is different than as a tourist, uh, you have to integrate somehow. You have to, you have to get get going, you know, get working. And uh, depending on if you speak the language or if you don't, the experiences are different. But, and there is, um, after after a couple of months, maybe after um, uh, nine months or so, there usually is some kind of depression. There is a kind of an exit point for many people returning to their countries because um, it's the moment of truth, so to say, where you ultimately must decide if you appropriate some of the country's concepts into your heart and stay and make good with, you know, putting another uh, glasses with another kind of color on top of your glasses, you know. We are all, there's a beautiful metaphor for that. We are all born with a set of glasses, blue glasses. Everyone, each of us, we are born with the blue glasses on. And then you go to another country, and that country will inevitably invite you to put another kind of pair of glasses on. Let's say it's a yellow uh, set of glasses. So you put the yellow, and you cannot do differently. You can either reject the new kind of glasses and leave, or you can put the yellow glasses on, and of course, then what you see will be green. So the additional layer of culture and of patterns that you learn, of which the language are great, maybe the part that matters most because it evokes different kind of thinking and so on. Once you put different uh, glasses on, the color of your view will always change. And even if you go back to your country, to the blue glass country, you will never see blue again. You will still see green because you cannot put off the yellow glasses from your host country. And of course, to me, that happened to you, I suppose. It, it has happened. You, you know this kind of effect. And of course, we, 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 can, we do these things volu voluntarily. So we interrupt our experience at a certain time. As a tourist, it's, it's easy to go back to your country and say, oh, what? America is still the best. You know, which is uh, the learned, I learned nothing reaction. But the rea uh, I, I, I never went to live in another country or to tour another country to say, oh, this is not good. Uh, but I, I like imagining is, could I live here and how would it be? I think that's a fascinating question. And what would it, would yeah. I live in Vietnam? No, that's definitely I a thought of experiment. I, I do immediately once I land in a new place. And uh, for a couple of days, it kind of fascinates me. And then I definitely get frustrated um, at some point. There's always something that doesn't work, and it's it's hard to overcome. I think nine months might be it might no, be a bit too long for this. Something that the, didn't work in Brazil, but in in the United States, everything works. Twink twink. Oh no! You just you. It's like any other place. The stuff works, and certain things don't work, or extremely expensive, and. Um, you're so you, you're, you're a tour American. The Germanness in you is not. It's not very strong, my friend. I feel the dark side. The Germanness, um, it's still there. Uh, sometimes it comes out. I, I, I gotta, I, in, you know, my my mom was basically Russian, so I have that too. So there's there's a lot of a lot of heartbeats in there. That's um, a rich, richness that you have. You are, you are, I, I enjoy. Trying to make use of it, yeah. Um, it's 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 harder than I thought, to be honest. Um, and uh, obviously, America sees itself as this monoculture. It kind of it kind of looks at it to be. 
we don't want to be like this, but but it's so much more comfortable to just speak English and to just be in this yeah. culture. And this is this is maybe people fall into this trap. Yeah, and to continue this this international part of the conversation a little bit more and broaden it, uh, you asked me about a, as an American, you know, from an American point of view, where should a young American live? And my no, answer global, is, global point of view, anyone. Anyway. Fuck Australia. Uh, forget New Zealand, all those other shitty countries in which English is the dominant language, because you will not learn shit. You will fool yourself. See, our, our, let's say our, our inclination to fool ourselves that the other country is similar is too big. That's why we should always look, try, again, following Oscar Wilde's advice, not mine. You can only know a country if you know two countries. That includes knowing a, a language. A country in which you live and do not learn the language is a country not acquired. I, uh, sometimes when I go to the Netherlands, I see signs there at the airport that say, if you live here, if you, if you are a foreigner living here for six months, fucking learn our language. <laughs> <laughs> fucking yeah, learn Dutch. There's I mean, this, growing, this growing movement of digital nomads. And what it is, it's kind of in between. I say longer, I love this place. No, no, it's just I'm a tourist. It's a but the question I is... The is is six months language? enough to pick up all these these languages? So you you, you have say six months in every single country in the world, or like in ninety different countries. No, no. Uh, say just fifty languages. It's a virus, and we cannot spread it to eat every country. When I go to Berlin, I see so many Americans who have no clue of nothing. I mean, nothing. Not of America, not of Germany, and they're speaking trash English. You know, and you know, that they have I, I, I think there's something else there. I mean, I agree with you. Americans are not great tourists. The problem, they, uh, wait, the, the problem is we are born ignorant, all of us. So we must acquire unignorance, so to say. It's a process of learning. We must subject ourselves to processes of learning. And that's what I'm advocating. I'm not trying to make fun of Americans and their ignorances or, or of white trash Americans who travel too much because they are also white. Trash Germans enough polluting every other country in the world, and, and and this is not a competition of you know, of blaming. Uh, but here's here's my my uh, my advice for anyone: try to live in a country in which they speak another language and acquire the language early on. It's not, it's not so difficult, you know, and and that is what integrates you. Otherwise, you don't have to have a chance of of really acquiring the taste of the country. To live in Brazil or to be in Brazil and not speak Portuguese, it it as you well said before, it 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 robs you of the opportunity to to understand the culture and the beauty and the subtleties of what this country has to offer. No, oh, absolutely, absolutely. The question is. Once you go into a digital nomad lifestyle where you're literally in a different country with a different language set, some speak some English, some don't, are you able to to pick up, say, 50 languages in a matter of 25 years? Is that something that there's very few people I've ever seen that speak more than, say, 10, 10 languages relatively fluently? And I, I've yet to, I'm, I'm trying to get them on the podcast. I don't know anyone. They, they're probably out there. So if they are, please, please, please get back to us. But can you scale this? I mean, there's a love affair I think we all have with a bunch of countries, uh, either by randomness or by uh, by birth. But it's a relatively finite um, experience, say five, six countries max. But, but then beyond the that and their language, how do we go from there? It, or is that impossible? No sane person in the world will ever define him or herself as a digital nomad. Otherwise, totally depressed or a fugitive or an escapist. So I would, I, would, I would argue, and this is a theory that I just, I'm just coming up with right now. Okay. People who call themselves digital nomads are not to be taken seriously. They don't live in their other country. They live in enclaves, like, like, just like many diplomats in the, in the past or so. It's easy. if you have, I once met the Canadian ambassador in an Eastern European country, a great woman. Did she speak all the languages? of the countries that she was a diplomat, a, cons a consul in? I, th I think so. I think she, she learned all of them. But no, th that doesn't matter so much. It doesn't matter if you are capable of learning the language, if you're really integrating, and if you're not a diplomat. But, I mean, those digital nomads only try to evoke their Silicon Valley dream lifestyle in other parts of the world and they don't give a shit about anything, most of them. Yeah, there's these people, I agree. But I'm not sure this is this is all of them. It's I, I kind of see it like the digital camera and the analog camera. Like the analog camera um, was way better than digital cameras for years and people still adopted the digital camera because of that other benefits that were 
scalable, I'm going to use this word again, but you can just say it was cheaper or it was simpler or I could take bigger, take more pictures. And I think something is going on with this nomadism. And I agree with you, the, the people we see right now, there's a lot of problems there. And I think depression is definitely one of them. But these, I mean, if you go to San Francisco right now, easily 50% of the residents can be described as clinically depressed. And every psychologist in the world will attest to this. So it, it, this is a global phenomenon. I don't know if the, the digital nomads, and I agree with you, they are certainly more American than not, but there's a lot of Eastern Europeans who do this um, when I go to Asia or when I was still able to go to Asia. And um, it, it, there is a mindset. It, it hasn't found a good, it's not a good word right now. I agree with you, but I think there's something there that people really truly cherish is this curiosity, is this getting out there and discover yourself. And you can pepper yourself, but you don't have to. Um, that is a choice that you can make. You yeah. can, as you say, for a diplomat, you can stay very pampered, but you don't have to be. Yes, but I think I think what you just said is very important. Um, digital nomadism is, by definition, an uncurious stance. Oh, not just, at all. Oh, I think so. I think so. Because, again, again, if you are interested in something other than yourself, you would be interested in, okay, I go to Vietnam. That's, for example, I, uh, what, something that I plan to do over the next couple of decades, to live in some more countries or some cities where I haven't lived. For example, I could imagine living in Rio de Janeiro. I haven't lived in, I, I lived in Sao Paulo for 12 years, but I never lived in Rio and I can well imagine living there. But not because of the beaches, because of several other factors that I find amazing about that city. And I can, I, can, I can imagine living for half a year or a year in Vietnam, but I would never call, call myself a digital nomad because of that. I would, I, would, I would call myself a student of Vietnam. And ideally, learning a bit of Vietnamese would be part of that challenge, you know? Very right, yeah, Most people derive their income through the digital means, and that's kind of uh, part yeah, of but, how, how this is fueled. Otherwise, most people can't do it. They, they literally have to be, uh, when we talked about organizations, part of the office, right? Or they have to be in the same, the same time zone, at least. So that makes it easier for people, that, that idea to digitize um, earning a living. Yes, but if we look at on, 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 on LinkedIn, if you would look up people's profiles on LinkedIn and look for digital moments, you would probably... Oh, yeah, probably... Did. I agree. <laughs> and or on Instagram, Instagram that's the same problem. You know, Costa Rica or whatever the countries, the yes. fashionable countries are at this moment, you would find very little of that. And so I, I think curiosity, and, and here's, here's a thing, I'll let, uh, again, maybe I'm a bit, a bit over-focused on our American audience here. But if I look at America, it worries me that even the fashions, the trends, the hip cycles that are supposedly about betterment are all driven by, by selfishness and self, in, let's say, over accentuation of, of me, of I. Take the mindfulness um, uh, fashion. Mindfulness supposedly is about being, it's not about being mindful, it's about yourself. The whole mindfulness movement and techniques also, interestingly, um, made famous, made turned into a worldwide uh, movement by Google people, people from Google and Google, the company itself. Mindfulness is just about me, 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 I, 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 I. It's about selfishness. Self selfishness in the in the in the last uh, ten years, it was rebranded into mindfulness, to, so it, that it sounds better. But mindfulness, even, even yoga, I mean, it may be an interesting technique to stay fit, in, but ultimately it's just about you, 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 and your thinking of yourself within yourself and the calmness you can achieve through yourself, yourself, yourself. That is the opposite of being a citizen. That is the opposite of being curious, the opposite of learning from, you know, exposing yourself to a world that's out there. That's what I, why I always would recommend live abroad, but live in a country with another language, a culture with significant cultural differences. I mean, for Americans, Mexico is perfect, of course. Yeah. Except, so. No, I, I hear what you're saying, and I think there's a, there's a lot of truth to this. Um, a lot of things went wrong, and there's the latest trends, so to speak. But, you know, this could, this could flip really quickly. Um, and I think there is, a, there is a consensus that things have, have not worked out, but... I think we, we touched that in, 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 in when we spoke earlier. And there is a tendency, and especially in America, but I think everybody has that, but America seems to be a little quicker with this. We do everything 
and try it out and eventually we figure out if it works or not. And sometimes it takes a while to figure out if it works or not. It might take 10 years, it might take 20 years, but we, 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 we run into these rabbit holes um, and that definitely is one of those, one of the rabbit holes that makes people depressed and has created. But it is also um, a result of technology that has helped um, this rise of depression and um, moved people away from each other. But it also created maybe some productivity, or maybe not. We don't we don't know the result of this yet. But what I'm trying to say is we we, we try out all these things, and eventually we 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 figure out what works, and that's what going to have a long term impact. Um, so that's. That's right. at least my my learning um, from the only twenty years I have in America. So hopefully there, there's some more uh, that some more learnings to be had. Yeah. Oh, oh. On this no. positive note, um, Neil, thanks for joining. That was fantastic. Thanks for your insights. We really appreciate that. It, I, I can say I, I enjoyed enormously enjoyed our conversation. We agreed on nothing, I think, which is great, which is the best, right? Which is what we wanted, right? <laughs> of this podcast I, th I suppose right <laughs> yeah most people agree all the time with me so or maybe i just i seek them out only people who agree with me you, them, I don't, you, are, I don't. You, 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 you try to also try this with me the, 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 you, fa you fascinated me into into believing everything you say but i try to resist and i hope i hope it was enjoyable to also listen to you know that's extremely uh, valuable absolutely thanks for doing this thank you very much see you soon bye-bye see you soon bye <laughs>